and uh, each one of us. I mean, not me only. That that was the that was the job of every agent throughout the South and maybe other places too. But uh, I liked it. I, and then when I came on down to Montgomery and to Selma, Alabama, and found that I had to work with Mr. S. W. Boynton, it was. He was like a brother to me, mm -hmm. and we worked so beautifully together. Things that I needed for my demonstrations, and he could get it, he got it. And things that I might have had to tell him, he would listen. And we, programs, we had a number of programs that we worked together. And it, it, it was a joy. He had been married, and his wife was, who was it? I was talking to the lady who was left here this morning. His wife, his first wife was from Mississippi, and she had left him, and later on she was burned in a, a, a meeting. It wasn't a meeting, it was a social that they had, and the place caught on fire and she was burned. And he had with him his mother, his sister, and his brother <coughs> because his father was killed in a train truck accident. So he brought them to Selma and he stayed just across the street where my house is now. But uh, six years we worked together, and we had friends. I had a friend from Tuskegee that uh, wanted to get married, and somehow S.W. Boynton aged him out. <laughs> <laughs> and I married <coughs> S.W. Boynton in 1930. Six. Wow. Nineteen hundred and thirty-six. <coughs> and our lives together was beautiful. And with the pressure that I had to endure, that both of us had to endure, caused his death. They told him they were going to kill him, and they didn't take a gun and shoot him. But the fella came to his office with a loaded stick. It happened that I was in the office at that particular time. And uh, he made an attempt to hit him, and I happened to grab the stick. Mm -hmm. And my husband was so evil-minded. He, he never became ruffled about anything. And when two guys came into <coughs> the office, this is my husband's office, and made an attempt to push him out. They finally got him out. Mm -hmm. And he screamed, hollered, cursed, and went on something terrible. Give me my stick. See, he was a realtor and an insurance agency also, and he was white. Mm -hmm. And we were the only African-American real estate and insurance agency. So uh, he he kept on screaming, and if ever anybody looked like the devil, he did. His hair seemed to have curled up on his head. His eyes were like two coals of fire. And he was screaming and frothing at the mouth when these guys took him out. And he kept on screaming, give me my stick. My husband nonchalantly said, give him a stick. Give him a stick. And I threw it out. And when I threw it out, he broke the glass door oh, from no. top to the bottom. He broke the, the two plate glass display windows that we had from top to bottom. Now, our office was across from the city hall. And the city hall had binoculars where they constantly 
look in our office because they would approach people who came in there and they'd even not give them, many of them, they would not give them their um, admit or permit to do their work like people who were contractors. They wouldn't give the taxi drivers their license because they got insurance from us. And they would tell them, you go back and get your money and go on over on the white side and get wow. your insurance. So we had to do a whole lot. But when that happened and the guy came into the office, in five minutes' time, I saw him walking down the street. They're right there where the police department was. When I called, they wouldn't come. Mm. But they figured when they saw him beating down the glasses, I guess they figured that he's done his job. <clears throat> and they came over and picked him up. And uh, he, he never spent any time in jail. He was never questioned or anything. You know, those, those things, everybody can't endure them. Mm -hmm. And my mother said to my husband, just come on up here. She was in Philadelphia, my father had passed. <clears throat> and he said, now, I'm not going to let anybody run me out of my house. But in about three days' time, he went to the hospital, and he never came out again, uh -huh. alive. But even in the, ho in the hospital, anybody <coughs> who would pass his room, or if they had him in a wheelchair, they would, he would tell them, brother, are you a registered voter? If you aren't, you go on and register because you are not a first class citizen until you become a reg registered voter. How did, um, how did SW propose to you? <laughs> After having worked with him for six years, it was a, it was a, a relationship that I would not want any battle with my brother. He would ask me to do things, and I would ask him to do things like it was in the spring of the year when three fellows from Tuskegee would come to Selma, where they were going with three girls. Oh. One fella was my associate, and of course the others went and just dropped off these fellas, and they, each one of them would use their cars. So he, um, this fellow, Malachi Morris, I'll never forget, and he was looking for a wife. <laughs> he, uh, came, he told me he was coming down, and uh, I told him, Mr. Boynton, that I would like for him to give me, to bring some coal, mm -hmm. because we had fireplaces then, and I would like to, uh, have the house warm. And he said to me, well, okay, I would like for you to let me use your car to take my girlfriend out. I said, all right. I could trust him with my car, and it was a new car. And uh, that day, the fellas came into Selma, and uh, we had dinner, and we're sitting in the living room talking. And the telephone rang. <clears throat> and he said, I don't know what he called himself, whether, whether it was Boynton or S.W., most likely it was Boynton. He said, I'm back. I said, you know, I told you to come by and pick me up Monday morning and we'll go down to the office. He said, but I'm back. I said, well, that's nice. Okay, thank you. The telephone rang about 30 minutes after that. Uh, did you understand me? I said that I'm back. 